not going to cast anything in the baptistry, but I did think about it. Wouldn't that be cool? If I had put a uh, catfish or something in there, that would have had some of you excited in here probably this morning. I'll lay this down right here for just a second later. Well, I'm glad that you guys are here this morning on Father's Day, and uh, we've come this morning to worship the King. And uh, it's always interesting to do that on a holiday because we want to draw attention to the Lord at the same time. We don't necessarily want to distract from that, but instead this morning, we want to be able to use kind of the natural time of year uh, to capitalize on that, to relate to you, but also to, to talk about God's truth and what He wants to say to you this morning. I want you to raise your hand this morning if you enjoy fishing. Anybody in this room enjoy fishing? There we go. Okay. All right. Rain was good yesterday. Water's been really low in our city, as you know. And... Um, Rain is good for fishing. I grew up in uh, uh, Lake Worth, Florida, Palm Beach County, Florida. I was born and raised there pretty much. And uh, when you live in a city like that, it's, it's pretty much a, a catch and release world. And what catch and release is, you just you basically you are just catching fish for fun. Uh, my wife, Cindy, comes from a different, a different school of thought on that, a <laughs> different worldview of fishing. And we, we've laughed a lot about the fact that in her school of fishing, um, she grew up saying, look, well, if you're not going to eat it, then what's the point of catching it, you know? And so it's kind of a, we kind of meet somewhere in the middle there, but growing up, you know, we're always just catching stuff and, and letting it go. Because to be honest, you don't know what's in the water where most of the fish were living before you caught it, you know, and you don't really care. You just want to put it back in there. So, uh, but it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, we talk about that a lot, you know, about catching fish and eating fish and keeping fish. Now, raise your hand if you love to eat the fish that you catch. Raise your hand. Is that you? All right. Well, good. We'll catch them out of the Gulf of Mexico, not on the retention pond. You'll do much better for your health. Um, so, you know, catch and release, it's a, uh, all, all kinds of states have catch and release programs. It, uh, you know, it's environmental stewardship. One of the things you do with catch and release is it makes sure that Hopefully there's fish there for your kids and for your grandkids to be able to catch because you didn't take them all for yourself, but you, you let them back uh, into the wild kind of where they belong. Uh, but to be honest with you, you know, that kind of stewardship was God's idea from the beginning. If you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, uh, what you're going to see in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is the way that God made the world and everything in it. And then he kind of decides that uh, from the beginning that man and women that were going to be the managers, the stewards of all of his creation. And it was, they were going to take care of it, and they were going to uh, uh, fulfill their, their calling in this creation through the job that God had given them to do. And so it's really God's idea when we talk about stewardship. But uh, I don't want to talk about environmental crisis. I mean, you guys are, are Floridians, and so aside from uh, me, myself, you know, born and raised Floridian, having the, the privilege of throughout the nation... Uh, most sources ascribe the most outrageous news stories to Floridians. It's crazy. I mean, from, from elections to, you know, just, just crazy things happening in the, in the culture. I mean, there's some crazy news every week, seems like, coming from the state of Florida. And uh, we know full well kind of about the nature and the gravity of environmental crises, right? And so we got some uh, Gators fans in here this morning and some Seminoles fans, probably maybe some Hurricanes in here. All we know is that if it starts with R and ends with Tide, you're not welcome in Florida, okay? So, um, and I'm not specifically speaking about football, but, uh, you know, last summer we couldn't do beach baptism uh, because of red tide. It was gross. It was nasty, and people got really irate about that, actually, and they're, they're searching for answers to try to solve exactly how to prevent that. So, hasn't been an issue this year, but I do, what I want to talk to you about this morning isn't, again, about environmental crisis so much at all. Uh, that's not it, but I believe we're living in a time when there is a socio-spiritual crisis happening in our culture, and I want to tie that back into what that has to do with catch and release, because I'm not talking about, um, you know, legal and the, the justice system. I'm not talking about fishing, uh, nothing like that, but really, uh, just for a moment, I want to talk to you about adulthood. Adulthood in our culture we're at a crisis for adulthood, and if I can be specific because it's Father's Day, I would say we're at a crisis uh, for manhood in our culture. For biblical manhood, we're just not seeing it. It's getting more and more rare, and there's a lot of people talking about why these things uh, might be happening, but maybe you can, you've looked around maybe noticed the same thing. You probably had a conversation. I, I talk to, to dads and moms all the time, obviously, uh, in student ministry, and it's not so much, you know, where have all the good men gone? It's about where are all the men, period. And uh, you, maybe you've said this at some point, but I've, I've, I've heard this just recently. Somebody saying something like uh, some dad who has a daughter saying, look, there's just, there's just no men out there for my daughter to date. Like, there's just, they're not out there. I don't even see them. I don't know if they exist. I got to read to you a little segment from an article uh, a female author wrote um, 
I caught this a while back. But she said this about that, uh, looking back. She said, the guys I have available, she's a young adult, the guys I have available to date are more like the kids I babysat than the dads who drove them home. Yikes. All right, ladies, in the, can I get any ladies in the house can relate to that? Maybe we need to hear an amen. Ladies in the house, okay. Or maybe it's a fishing thing. Maybe she just say, fish on. You know, maybe that's better than amen this morning. But either way, God's got you, girl. He's going to make you a fisher of men, just not in that sense of the term, okay? He's got you. Um, but where are all the men? I, I was got to talk to uh, my dad. He's been in town uh, this weekend. Glad to have him, him here. And we just got to talking the other night um, about his dad. Uh, my grandfather, I don't know about you, maybe you have a grandfather, a great-grandparent who was in World War II. Uh, well, mine was, and he was in the South Pacific. And uh, he was a 29-year-old guy and uh, going to the University of Florida, among some other things there, he decided to enlist. And so uh, found his way onto a cargo ship in the South Pacific that was kamikaze by a Japanese Zero. And it, uh, I don't know, we talked about, I don't know if the ship fully sank but he, does, he did comment on the fact that he saw the cook floating, you know, with the, with the Joe pot, the coffee pot. Like, that was his flotation device. There's the cook. He's out there floating in the, in the South Pacific. So there's my 29-year-old grandfather, you know. Um, I don't know if you've done much research on World War I, World War II, but I think the average age of any, of any fighter pilot on all sides in World War II was 20. Average age. It's 20 years old. So you do a little bit of research, a little bit of reading, which I really suggest that you do. It's, it's fascinating. It's, it's, it'll challenge you. Uh, but you'll read about, if you look about the, the airmen, the Air Force, the Marines, those kind of things, you'll find a lot of those B-17s, those B-25s were piloted by crews, complete crews of guys who were 18 to 21 years old on some of them. And I don't know how you'd feel if you walked on to, uh, where's Derek, Spirit Airlines, you know, and your pilot is 21, I don't know, your pilot is 18, you may, or uh, American Airlines, I mean, you might think, get a little skeptical, right? Because that's typically not our experience in 2019 with your average 18 or 19-year-old. But I want to tell you, if you look back in history, you'll see that it wasn't always that way. And before you start talking about uh, brain scans, and before you start talking about, well, teenagers, they don't have a fully formed prefrontal cortex and all this kind of thing, so we, can't ex we have to set our expectations a little bit lower, we have to set our, give out our responsibilities a little bit less. Before you go that far, let me just say this, um, because if you're going to argue that, well, that preformed prefrontal cortex in the brain is kind of delaying adulthood, and we can't give these kind of responsibilities to kids today, because that just wouldn't go over, it might be impossible uh, I would stop you there and say, well, maybe, maybe that might be as impossible as becoming a successful professional angler with no arms and no legs. Maybe it's that kind of impossible. But I want to tell you, um, man, Clay can do things with his chin, with his shoulder, with his mouth, with his neck that you and I could never do. And you know what the only reason is that he can do it is because we've never had to do that to survive. But he does. And so when it comes to adulthood and, and talking about why that's missing in our culture, I, it's there. I, I think it's there. Every, every ingredient that we need in God's economy is there to see that rise up. But the fact that it isn't, isn't because it's not there or because people have changed so much. Culture has changed, sure, but I truly believe that God has put it there. We can't blame biology for it. Adulthood is meant to be caught and released, and we've got to do a better job of releasing adulthood on this generation. Dads, We've got to do a better job of releasing adulthood and manhood um, on your sons and biblical womanhood on your daughters. You've got to catch that and release those things. The maturity, the responsibility, the leadership, those things that were, were insulating as a culture, were insulating and protecting our youth from uh, are getting us in serious trouble. It's a critical time in the church. It's a critical time in our church, which is why I'm so glad and I know uh, Pastor Michael is and so many others are so glad that during this time in the last year our church has really begun to take seriously uh, internships and ministry. So you get to see some of those young adults running around our campus, not just in our student ministry but in our children's ministry and other places because we're serious about investing. We want to see within the church of God, we want to see these, these young people develop those areas of maturity and responsibility and leadership and internships do that kind of stuff and we love that. Now, the Bible has something to say about this, too, and I want you to open there with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 4. Uh, I want to look at just a, a quick passage here of, of catch and release. I want to move you through a whole 
outline of some stuff that I hope will, will help you today get your brain around this. Uh, but we were designed with the capacity to receive, to catch spiritual insight, and then we're also designed with the responsibility to give it, to release that spiritual insight through exercising our, our spiritual influence there. But in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, listen to what Solomon says. Listen, my sons, to a father's discipline and pay attention so that you may gain understanding, for I'm giving you good instruction. Oops. Don't abandon my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender and precious to my mother, he taught me and said, your heart must hold on to my words. Keep my commands and live. So who's speaking in this passage? Solomon. Who's Solomon's daddy? David. So apparently somewhere along the line, Solomon decided that he was going to do the same thing that his daddy had done. I don't know about you, but that would be a pretty incredible person to pour into your life about spiritual truth, about mistakes, about wisdom, about how that all interacts in relationships. Uh, we can't sit here and say that, well, because of David's input that Solomon did it perfect. We know that's not true at all. But I want to tell you that at least David had modeled something to Solomon, and Solomon was trying to model something right back to his sons as well. He had caught, uh, David had caught a vision, caught a word, an experience from God. He captured those things, and he decided to release those things on his son for his good. And you can read, I'll read the rest of the language in chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7. You're going to hear the same thing. This father pleading with his sons to pay attention, to pay attention, to go this way, don't go this way, do this and don't do that. It's all about catching wisdom from God and releasing it onto the next generation. To be honest with you, it's all throughout the Bible. It's all throughout the Bible. And I think if we could, if we could narrow it down to one person aside from the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's one person who did it above and beyond anybody else in Scripture in terms of catching God's truth and releasing that. His name is the Apostle Paul. Which is why essentially half of the New Testament is, is that, is catching and releasing. He's caught, he's caught this wisdom from God and he's been called as one of the apostles and what he's trying to do is release that wisdom and that influence to as many people as he can strategically in those churches. Just name some books that Paul wrote. That's catch and release. He's caught from God and he's passing it on. In fact, he's going to say it just like that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is where we're going to camp out this morning uh, in terms of our, our main text today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is just in a great deal of instruction with a very dysfunctional church. Everything from morality, dealing right down with the order in worship and how services uh, should occur so that the name of Jesus is exalted and people aren't being exalted and so there's not confusion but clarity when it comes to the gospel. And then he comes back, right back around and says this. This is such a beautiful passage. We're just going to look at one verse. I want to read the section. We'll come back to one verse of it. Paul says, Now, brothers, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. You, re uh, you received it and have taken your stand on it. You are also saved by it if you hold to the message I proclaim to you, unless you believe for no purpose. Listen to this. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one abnormally born, he also appeared to me. He uses the same phrase, back in, look at verse 3 again. It says, for I passed on to you as most important, what I also received. He uses that same exact phrase in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 23. For what I received, I also passed on to you. You and I were intended to release, catch and release spiritual truth from God. It doesn't stop with you. It's kind of like, you know, you're the, you're the river, not the reservoir. It comes from God, and then you are supposed to be responsible to release God's truth at the right time, in the right context, with people. It's a personal assignment, and we all have part of that assignment. Now, that assumes one thing, because I want to be really direct with you this morning. I, you, you can't release spiritual truth that you have not caught for yourself. So the implication here is that, is that there's an expectation that God is speaking to you. You can't 
you're not going to be able to, to give that truth, dads, to your kids, to your coworkers, to your spouse. You can't, you can't lead them in some kind of significant way unless you have caught a vision of what God wants to do for yourself. And that's going to come right, right through here. I love that Clay shared that about it, opening the Bible and calling that thing. He said, you open my Bible, right there to Matthew chapter 6. You know why that matters? Because the revelation doesn't come apart from this. So if you haven't captured God's truth for yourself, if, if you haven't seen that in your life for yourself, it's going to be impossible for you to pass it on to someone else. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy to me, but you know, when I was 15 years old, I read my Bible and I prayed, but I think... Uh, right now, it's, it, I, can, I feel like I can hear the Lord faster than I could then because I recognize His voice a little bit better now than I could then. It's kind of like fishing as well. You can be a great fisherman when you're 10, you know, but when you're 20, 30 years old, you're probably going to be better. Why? Because you don't use a fishing pole anymore? No, you're going to use the same kind of stuff. You're just going to be more familiar with how this all works. You'll be better at catching because you've done it more. It's the same way in your spiritual life, too. Now, before I make that connection, I do want to make one more fishing analogy, if you'll let me. I want you to take out in your uh, worship guide this morning. There's a page two, and it says, Fishing Skills Challenge. So right now, this morning, we're going to take a second and do that. We're going to separate the men from the boys, the women from the girls. Not really. Um, but here on the screen, I want to give you some, just some basic fishing things, and we'll see how well you can do. All right, some... Maybe it's going to be a little bit easy for you, and that's great. Maybe you're a fishing expert. Maybe it's not going to be, so we're going to give you some useful full tools this morning. So here's question number one. You can put it up on the screen. Okay, here's a peacock bass. Those are nice. Uh, we actually have quite a few of those in the, between uh, West Palm Beach and Miami on uh, the other coast. But here's what I want you to do. Is this a freshwater, saltwater, or brackish water fish? I want you to write down your answer in space number one, A, B, or C. All right? No cheating, all right? So don't help your neighbors. Don't get your phone out. Don't ask Siri, okay? No cheating, but just to see how good you can do. Is this is a freshwater fish, saltwater fish, or brackish water fish. Five, four, three, two, one. All right? Answer? Here's the answer. All right, hey, good job. Give yourselves a hand for freshwater fish. Okay, good. Some of you are going, oh, okay. And that's all right. It gets harder. Oh, here's round two. This is a bullhead catfish. Now, I need you to, to do your best to try to figure out which, which hook do you want to use, the, the best hook to catch this fish. You've got A, B, or C. And I want you to think about, if you're going fishing, here's the tackle box. You've got three hooks, which hook you're going to pick up. And you've got five seconds to decide. In five, four, three, two, one. Got your answer? It is C. I heard some rejoicing for the circle hook over there. And I heard some weeping and gnashing of teeth as well. All right, here's the final one. Here you go. Just sailfish. Ooh. A, B, C, or D. You want to catch one of these babies? You want to go offshore? Well, somebody just said, here's four lures. We want you to pick the one that's going to catch the fish. All right? See if you can pick it. In five, four, three, two, one. Here it is. A. All right. Oh, the gnashing of teeth. Oh. All right. So now, now score it because, man, it, you're, you're only passing with a C. If you got two out of three, that's, you know, you're not, not doing so hot. Uh, but maybe, and raise your hand if you got them all right. You got them all right. Look at that. Yes. Give those, give those folks a hand. You guys are, you're pros. You're experts. You're experts out there. Um, See, I'm helping you, so don't, don't be mad. Get glad, okay? I'm helping you, so now you'll know next time you go out fishing with a buddy of yours. Now, I do want you to take out your outline, though, because here I want to get back to this idea of what God has for you today, and we're just going to fly right through this. It's not fly fishing. I wouldn't put that kind of a pun into this sermon, and yet I think I just did. Um, but essentials for catching, because what we're concerned about, what we need to be concerned about primarily is not not so much catching fish, but catching from God. I don't know about you, but I want to catch a fresh picture of what God wants for me every day. Uh, I, want to, I want to know what that is. And so uh, essentials for catching. This isn't going to shock you, but I want to give you a couple of things to think about today, especially for you dads. Essentials for catching. Number one is preparation. Preparation. So essentials for catching. You want to catch some fish? You got to prepare. Now, I, uh, Clay's not down here in the front row anymore, and, but I would ask him, you know, if he was here, uh, there's a lot of thought and preparation that goes into successful fishing. 
There's a lot of thought and preparation that goes into successful fishing. You know what? Your spiritual life is the same way. And your expectations should be the same. So if you're not going to spend a lot of time uh, thoughtfully preparing and investing in your spiritual life, don't be shocked when your spiritual life is about this deep or totally dry because you just haven't prepared. It's like if you don't prepare very much, you have to go fishing, just kind of pick up a rod and walk out there, just prepare to not catch very much. But if you can be calculated and you can be thoughtful and prepared and you can find the resources, you're going to be much more successful. Uh, First Peter, Peter says it like this in First Peter chapter 1, verse 13, says, Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Sounds like Peter's saying you need to be ready. Sounds like you need to get prepared all the time. Uh, Paul says it in Colossians 3, 2. There's so many. I'm just pick, picking up a few. He says, set your minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth. He's saying, get, set your, get your, mind, uh, your mindset straight. And this is my favorite one. This is uh, from Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Uh, Paul says, uh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires. Here's, the, here's my best way of saying it. I've been saying this for a couple of years with our students. That verse, it's all about preparation. Here's what he says. You need to change your spiritual clothes and chart your spiritual course, period. That's what he's saying. You want to get prepared to face the battles, to face life, to have a victorious life? You need to change your spiritual clothes, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and chart your spiritual course. I'm not making plans today to satisfy my flesh. It's all about preparation. I, you know, Clay came up here in his jersey this morning, but I think if you just asked him, just sat down with him at lunch today and said, hey, walk me through the stuff you did to prepare for a tournament, it would blow your mind. It would blow your mind, the little details that he would go through. You guys, you fish, you know this. It, it, it would blow your mind. He would talk, right? I mean, yes, does that include the things he's wearing? Absolutely. Right down to the shirt he's wearing, the shorts he's wearing, the gear he's wearing. And then you better believe it. He's going to study that lake that he's going to backwards and front. He's going to, he's going to get his clothes right, get his, get his uh, equipment right, and then he's going to chart his course. And you better believe he's going to know, try to be in these different places all throughout the day at this time with this bait, period. Now, you know, char- change your spiritual clothes, chart your spiritual course. Just like, it is like fishing. I mean, life kind of, you get prepared, but then you've got to kind of roll with it, you know. It doesn't always go how you and I plan. And so there's an expectation that, you know, things might not have be going as we've planned, but you know what? At least we've got a plan to go by, and, and then that's when you trust in God. Say, so you know what? I'm out here on the lake. I thought I'd be at this end. Now a storm just broke out. Well, now I've got to just sit, sit tight for a little while. That's okay. God does that. That's all right. But in your life in general, we need to be prepared. If you're going to be catching a word from the Lord and want to be receiving from Him what He has for you, you've got to spend a lot of time in preparation. That's number one. It's all about catching. Same thing in fishing. Preparation number two is position. Okay, so you prepare, you prepare, you prepare, and then, then you've got to get in the right spot. That's position, and this is uh, in your listening guide, and what does position mean? Well, it's proximity to God, His Word, and to faithful believers. If you want to catch a word from Him, catch His truth so that you can release it, you're going to have to take serious your proximity to God, His Word, and faithful believers. Jeremiah 29 11 is a great one. Uh, talk, you know, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you future and hope. But I think 12 and 13, I think I only gave you guys 12, but really 13, to me, speak more to me almost than verse 11. Listen to what Jeremiah says. He says, uh, this is the Lord speaking. He says, you will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You know, James picks up something real similar to that in, in uh, James chapter 4, the beginning of verse 8. It says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So here's this encouragement in the Scripture. I can go through a whole bunch of them. Isaiah 55 says, hey, call upon the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. It's this idea of proximity to God. You know, it does, he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. But, but relationally, you know what? There, it, there is some responsibility that falls to you. And it falls to me, too. And it isn't met without God's promises. He's saying, if you'll draw near to God, he's saying, I'll I'll promise you this. You want to seek me with all your heart, you will find me. That's a pretty good promise. There's about 7,000 promises in the Bible that God makes, by the way. That's just one of them. That's a pretty good one, I'll tell you. But he says, James says, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Let me me get another instruction from 1 Corinthians that Paul says in chapter 5, verse 11. He says, but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer who is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat 
with such a person. All right, now here we're talking about proximity to God, His Word, and there's a reason why I put faithful believers there, because the context here is about catching wisdom from God, okay? So Paul's making some, it's not just a New Testament idea either. Look at this, Psalm 26, verse 4. The psalmist says, I do not sit with the worthless or associate with hypocrites. All right, now, now let me, again, I want to set the context for you so don't get up, upset, don't hear this wrong, but obviously, if you look throughout the testimony of Scripture, what you're going to see is uh, people who are faithful to God, um, episode after episode, narrative after narrative, of people being influenced by proximity to the crowd, okay? And if that crowd is not faithful to God, you're going to see immediate impact in the life of those individuals versus the ones that set themselves apart and they, they strategically make proximity for themselves and other people who are faithful to God. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the Bible. It's like the message of the entire Bible. You're going to see how that plays out in life. Young man, young woman, you're going to see how that plays out in your life as well. You want to get your proximity close to people who could care less about God? You're going to see something happen in your life that's going to look markedly different from the kind of people who are setting proximity to people who are faithful to God. But I do want to say this to you, too, because I know you also find examples in the Bible of people who were faithful to God, okay, but they were still in proximity to people who were completely lost, not least of which is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, okay? So we're not saying that believers shouldn't be in relational distance or be friends with people who aren't. Don't share those same beliefs about God or worldview or whatever. No, I think the Bible actually argues uh, to the other side, you should have gospel proximity to those folks. What I am saying is this. You, at the same time, must, if you're going to catch truth from God, your proximity to faithful believers has to be there. It has to be there, too. It has, and the people that you run with, that's really who I'm talking about. You want to set up to be able to receive from them, what they have caught from God sets your proximity close to faithful believers. That's why Paul says, look, there's going to be a lot of people that call themselves brother, and they're in all kinds of junk. He says, I, don't even, I wouldn't even eat with those kind of people. Again, we're not talking about gospel proximity. We're just talking about people who play the game. And if you're going to expect to receive some kind of wisdom or message from God from people who play the game who aren't real, you're going to be really sadly mistaken. So it's really important you want to catch from God your position is everything. Get close to God. Get close to somebody who can mentor you, a faithful person who can mentor you, who can release upon you the things that they've caught from the Lord. It's a critical, critical point, clarification here. All right, so there's catching. Let me walk you through essentials for releasing real quick today before we get out of here. Essentials for releasing. Number one is imitate. Imitate. 1 Corinthians 4.16, Paul says, Therefore I urge you to imitate me. That's pretty direct. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians, he says it again, chapter 11, verse 1. He says, Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Okay, this is interesting. Because we're going to release God's truth after we've caught it. Here's, here's kind of step number one. We've got to imitate it. We've got to personally apply this for ourselves. That's the next thing. So imitate is personal application. Personal application. Uh, Philippians 4, 9, Paul said it again, Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Imitate has to do with personal application, your own integrity, your priorities, your boundaries, your goals. No one can do that for you. You have to release God's truth in your own life by applying it to your own life before you can release it to someone else. You have to put your faith in those things in your own life and let those things be prevalent. Now, I don't know about you, but some of the best things I ever learned fishing was just copying what somebody who's a better fisherman than me would do. That's it. My brother, he thinks like a fish. So I find myself fishing out there. Sometimes I just think, man, what would, what would John do? Because he thinks like a fish. Honestly, I've, I've, I've done that, and I've been successful, not because I had it within me, but I thought, I've seen somebody else better than I am do this, and what would they do? Spiritual life is the same way. You're going through a situation. You can't figure your way out. Hey, think about that spiritual mentor in your life. Say, what would they do? Well, I think they might fast and pray. That seems pretty radical, but I'll give it a shot. It's crazy. Paul encourages you to do that. Don't wait till it makes sense. Just do it. Just copy it. It's fine. That's fine. You need to have that personal application there in your life, and then you need to initiate. 
So after you receive these truths from God, you want to release it, you need to imitate it in your own life, apply it personally, then you need to initiate, you need to pass it on. Pass on that information. Pass on that information. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Paul says, I passed on to you as most important what I also received. He's passing it on. And 2 Timothy 2, 2, he says to Timothy, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This has to do with intentionally passing those things along in a timely and strategic manner. Dad, you can't wait to be asked. Moms, you can't either. Christians, you can't either. You can't wait until your classmates, your co-workers ask you. We hope that it's happening, but you can't wait until then to take the opportunity to speak. You've got to initiate that process, and it needs to be strategic, and it needs to be thought through. And we need to take the initiative and follow through. I'll leave you with this final uh, fishing analogy. But, you know, if you, if you go fishing and you talk about passing it on and, and initiating, if you catch a fish and you release it on land, what's going to happen? Thank you. It's going to die. I know. Unless it's a walking catfish, brother. I know. All right. <laughs> then, then it'll probably walk its way back into the water or whatever. Well, basically, if you, for the most part, you catch a fish and you let it go on land, it's dead. What happens if you catch a fish and you, well, you release it on land? What, what if you catch a fish and you release it into the live well in your boat, okay? It might live for a little while, but you're still going to have to do something with that fish because ultimately it's going to die in that live well too. You know, what if you catch a fish? This almost happened to me the other day. You catch a fish and it's been out of the water for too long before you release it. It's probably not going to make it. It's going to be belly up in the water and the osprey is going to come down and it's going to be awesome. Or the alligator is going to come up and he's going to thank you for lunch. But it's the same thing in your spiritual life too. When you catch that stuff, you, it matters when you release it. It matters where you release it. The outcome of what you want to see happen, don't sit on it. You can't sit on that. Dads, you can't, you can't wait for your kids to ask you about the internal process that you're always thinking about. It's not obvious to everybody, and I've said that before, but it's not obvious to everybody. Men, we do a bad job. I do a bad job, too. I just assume because I, this is what I'm doing, you kind of get the process. It's not obvious to everybody what you're doing. Release that, release that knowledge to your kids. Release that knowledge to those of influence around you. We're not supposed to wait until we're asked to release those spiritual truths. You need to pass it along. Take that initiative today to do that. Um, you know, the, the Greek word um, for evangelism, euangelion, it's this Greek word. It's a, it's a military term, and it's when they would send their herald to announce to the rest of the country that victory had been won. And in those days, they'd send their evangelists. That's where the word came from. He'd go and declare the good news to cities that otherwise would have no idea they'd been set free. We've got to release that news. There's, there's a generation out here in Sarasota. There are eight out of ten people who are not in church today just have no idea. They don't, they don't have any idea the battle's already been won. They think they've got to keep fighting it for themselves. And I'm telling you, we've got to release God's truth. Now that you've caught it, we've got to release it into their lives as well. I want you to think about this week, people in your circle of influence, your coworkers, your family, your neighbors that need to hear that message. Let's not release the fish on land. Let's not wait till the fish are almost dead. Like, let's not sit on it. Let's go and, let's go and tell them. Let's be strategic and take the initiative on that. I want you to pray with me right now. As you bow your heads and close your eyes.